Why won't you just say don't do the crime if you can't do the time? I don't understand. Just that's the answer to it. It's like, hey, if Trump didn't want to get prosecuted criminally, perhaps he should have not done the crimes like so openly and so frequently. <laughs> Who amongst us hasn't had their lawyer go to federal prison for paying hush money? Who amongst us? I'm just saying this can happen to the average American. OK, this can happen to any and every American. Anyway, let's watch what Trump is doing, though. We are live outside the New York City courthouse where Donald Trump's first criminal trial is underway. Moments ago, they just took a break for lunch. They have been inside that courtroom for several hours, but no actual jurors have yet been brought inside the room as they are still arguing over stuff that happens before the trial gets officially underway, what evidence can be argued, whether or not Donald Trump has been has violated his gag order. I should know we've spent a lot of time outside this Manhattan courthouse where Donald Trump is going to be spending the next six to eight weeks. Today is especially loud as you can hear some of his supporters are out here. Some of his detractors are over to our left. Uh, obviously a lot of members of the media as this has fueled intense coverage given its historic nature. It is the first criminal trial of a former president to ever be held. So we are watching all of this and Paula, you know, Bro, why does it sound like a, uh, why does it sound like they're just drinking beers in the background, barbecuing and sh like they're, they're day drinking right before it sounds like a tailgate, right? This break, what prosecutors are asking it, it, the judge to do here is to find Donald Trump for violating his gag order. That's right. They're pointing to three posts that he has made, at least one of which he refers to Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen, potentially two key witnesses in this case, as, quote, sleazebags. And here the prosecutors are asking for him to be fined $1,000 for each post and also asking the judge to warn Trump, remind him that if he continues to violate this gag order, he could be held in contempt. Dude, what a... Dude, what a time. Michael Avenatti, Michael Avenatti tweeting from, I guess he's no longer in prison. Didn't he go to jail too? Um, but Michael Avenatti getting quote tweeted for agreeing with mother Donald Trump. That's awesome. Wait, what? Madison Cawthorn? No. Okay, we'll do that in a little bit. We gotta, we gotta do this though. This is fire. Tapped. Now the judge has not yet ruled uh, on this motion. And of course we are in a break, but this is gonna be an issue that will likely come up pretty much every day. And we are joined outside this courthouse by Judge Jill Conviser, a former New York State Supreme Court Justice who is also friends with Judge Mershon. That is the judge overseeing this case. Then Trump has tried unsuccessfully time and time and time and time again to recuse himself from this case. And Judge, it's great to have you here, especially just given your knowledge of Judge Mershon, because he has, you know, intense impact on shaping what this is going to look like. And right now on day one, he's being faced with this decision. Did Donald Trump violate this gag order? And how does he respond? If so, he's deciding clearly after Bray, after the lunch break, how do you think he's weighing this? Well, I think that Juan Rashan is in a great position to be the judge in this particular case because of the depth of his experience. Uh, people look at the Trump case very carefully and under a microscope because for obvious reasons. But it is quite loud here. But um, obviously, Juan Marchand for 15 years has handled difficult defendants before and de dealt with defendants who have acted out in courtrooms, defendants who are alleged murderers, rapists. This is what we do. It is the landscape um, in which we toil. So I don't think this is a huge lift for Juan Mershon, um, uh, for Judge Mershon. I do think, however, that um, if it were me, certainly I would warn the defendant again. Doing a uh, contempt proceeding at this point will slow everything down. It doesn't really benefit anyone. I have to get your perspective on something that, that also Trump has just been arguing that he wants to do, which is when there are those sidebars between the judge and the prosecutors and Trump's defense team, Trump wants to be able to approach the bench. How unusual is That's that? That's awesome. That's entirely unusual. I would never allow it. The defendant in any criminal case is entitled to hear any of those sidebar conversations if they involve issues for which the, the goat, dude. Oh, God, this is so good. Now, imagine actually having cameras inside of the courtroom like the Georgia case. The fact that the Georgia uh, courts have not already continued with that Rico case with Fonnie Willis leading the helm is so frustrating to me because like, oh my God, dude, I want to see Trump inside the courtroom so 
bad. Oh my God. It will be the greatest. It will be the absolute best. Apparently, what? Trump was asleep at times? Oh, that's so sick. Haberman, Maggie Haberman is in the courtroom saying Trump appeared to be asleep. Ago. His head would fall down. He didn't pay attention to his note. The lawyer passed him. His jaw kept falling on his chest and his mouth kept going slack. Oh, you wrote an observation. Oh, I'm going to nut. That I'm going to nut. I'm going to nut thinking about like, oh my God. Imagine seeing that on camera. The memes. Uh, I, I was very surprised. Trump appears to be sleeping. His head keeps dropping down and his mouth goes slack. Tell us about that. Well, Jake, he appeared to be asleep, and you know, he repeatedly his his head would would fall down. There have been other moments in other trials, like the uh, the Agent Carroll trial, which was around the corner uh, in January, where he appeared very still and seemed as if he might be sleeping, but then he then he would move. This time, he didn't pay attention to a note that his lawyer Todd Blanche passed him. His jaw kept falling on his chest, and his mouth kept going slack. Now, uh, you know, sometimes people do fall asleep during court proceedings, but it, it's notable given the intensity of this morning and a lot of what was being argued. Yeah, that's rather surprising. What was and Brad now taking on his highest profile case to date, his case against the former president underway. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. We cannot and will not normalize serious criminal conduct. Bragg, who is a Democrat, making good on a campaign promise to make Trump a priority. I'm ready to go wherever the facts take me. I believe we have to hold them accountable. Trump has called his trial political persecution and has repeatedly directed his anger at Bragg, someone he's called an animal and a degenerate. The racist Manhattan District Attorney Alvin <laughs> Bragg who is presiding over one of the most dangerous and violent cities in the United States. Should be noted that Bragg's office has received racist threats. They've received threats of violence since taking on the case, but Bragg has remained committed to the case. Aaron saying the following, someone lied again and again to protect their interests and evade the laws to which we are all held accountable. Aaron Not gay. United Straits of America, not United Gays of America, folks. If you leave it up to Brandon, he'll make it United Gays. So Alvin, or DA Bragg, um, he's very cautious. He's careful. He's really, really a very smart lawyer, smart in, um, in a strategic, lawyerly way, smart about people. Um, but he's also just very, very committed to justice. I think one thing people don't know about him is the extent to which this trial in this case is just a small sliver of what his office is focusing on and what he's doing. He really is is focused during the campaign. I was shocked to find out that a DA is committed to justice, man. I like my DAs being committed to injustice. That's my favorite type of DA is one that hates uh, justice, actually. The office. So in this particular case, he is obviously, he's making history, right? He's the first prosecutor to put a former, uh, an American president on trial. Um, and yet, you know, we've all heard from the very beginning, this is the least consequential, the least strong, the most political case. I mean, this has been a talking point from the beginning. It's not going to be the only case we're probably going to get a verdict in, in of all of them, though. Um, but one of the complaints specifically has been that these are misdemeanor charges, and he elevated these charges to felonies. Um, and that that is where this is going to fall apart with the jury, not whether he made a payment, not whether it's the felony aspect of it. I know that you supervise cases like this, criminal cases like this for six years, right? So this is your bread and butter. You know it. What do you think? So we routinely, I was the labor bureau chief, and so we brought wage theft cases, cases involving employers <clears throat> who were cheating on their unemployment taxes and other kinds of workplace laws. And we routinely brought cases where there were charges of false business records um, as felonies. This is a very common charge, not just in the workers' rights space, but mm. throughout New York uh, state criminal practice. And so that aspect of it, saying that these are, you know, that, that this is something that's never pr prosecuted, that's just simply not true. That's untrue. All right. Yeah. So now the other criticism, and Jason just referenced this in his piece, but Bragg's, um, some of the criticism has been, well, how he got elected to begin with, right? He's a Democrat, and this is the way we do it in this, uh, you know, you run for DA. So people are parties, and what you get out of that is somebody who has a political party. And in his case, he had talked specifically about how he was going to hold Trump to account if he won. It was part of his platform. And the most infamous soundbite is this one. 
I'm the candidate in the race who has the experience with, with Donald Trump. I was the chief deputy in the attorney general's office. We sued the Trump administration over 100 times. So, you know, you, you, work, you worked on his campaign. I mean, I understand, you know, you support him. But what do you say to people who say this is politics? He ran on saying, I'm going to go get Donald Trump. And then he went and did that. Well, so I did volunteer on his campaign, as did many dozens and dozens of us who worked in the office, even though he was no longer there, because we all really believed in him, hmm. having worked with him for years. And the truth is that on his campaign, looking at his campaign literature, going to the events, he talked about so many different things. He talked about, as I said, ending two systems of justice. He talked about public service. He talked about um, bringing workers' rights cases and protecting tenants and taking a different approach that would be more strategic and preventive of crime. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, the, yes, the issue of Donald Trump came up um, when he was questioned, and he answered honestly that the attorney general's office in New York, where where he was the number two, uh, you know, the first deputy, right. um, had brought cases, as had many other AG case AG offices in California and Massachusetts. Why wouldn't you just say, "Don't do the f crime if you can't do the time"? I don't understand. Just that's the answer to it. It's like, hey, if Trump didn't want to get prosecuted criminally, perhaps he should have not done the crimes, like so openly and so frequently. <clears throat> the defendant could give input. So if it's strictly legal, the defendant has no right to be there. But if it's anything with a factual basis, the defendant does have a right to be there. And logistically, I think that's a challenge for Judge Marchand to make sure that the defendant has that opportunity. If it means clearing the courtroom or going in the back, as we often do, Logistically, again, it's hard here because you. It's really f***ed up. Don't make fun of people uh, losing their life savings on True Social. I'm one of them. Okay, it's not funny, nor is it cute, to make fun of people for losing their entire life savings on True Social. I thought we were going to the moon. I'm still a holder. I'm hodling, but it's f***ed up to make fun of people for losing their life savings like that. You have Secret Service. You have court officers. Um, and a lot of lawyers, uh, so that makes it a little more complicated. Well, and what happened right before this this break happened? And, and I should note, just you were mentioning how loud I am. Diamond hands, not paper hands. What it is here? I mean, it is kind of a circus down here. Is really the most generous way to describe it? It's always a little bit crazy. Paul and I have spent a lot of time down here. Today feels especially more so. I mean, some of his former supporters are just circling the courthouse, really, as he is inside. He just left without speaking. But one thing the judge was just doing was reading Trump his rights and telling him that if he disrupts this trial, that the judge has the right to exclude him and even potentially jail him if that happens. What would have to, what's the threshold for something like that? Well, that's a good question. Every defendant has a right to be present at their own trial. That right is fundamental, but it is not absolute. In other words, if a defendant by their conduct cannot follow the rules of the courtroom, uh, cannot follow the rules of the staff in the courtroom, speaks out over the judge, um, the de a defendant can forfeit their right to be present. And if the defendant continues to do that, um, I would say he would find himself in a bit of in a bit of trouble. Hi, I'm curious on the fair use policy regarding watching live TV. Why are you allowed to just watch Aaron Burnett without contributing anything to CNN? My bad if this is a dumbass question. What do you mean without contributing? I am contributing. Through been commentary, 14 months chatter. Judge Michon is not going to tolerate it. He is a consummate professional. He is a fair. Bro said Aaron Burnett, like, like he's on a first name basis. It's all fair use chatter. Fair and just jurist, and he will do everything he can to ensure that the defendant gets the fair trial to which he is entitled. And if that includes taking him out of the courtroom because he, you know, he destroys the process or infects it uh, deleteriously. Uh, he will do that. And the, warning the defendant is the only standard. If the defendant knows and persists, he can be waltzed out uh, not to return. He can be jailed, too. Um, we'll see if that happens. How would you describe how Judge Marchand is in the courtroom? You know, if you're... We don't have cameras in there, so we can't actually see what it looks like. We just see sketches, pictures. We get our dispatches from our team. How would you, how would you describe it to someone who's sitting at home and, and is curious what it, it's actually like in the room? I would say that... Dude, come on. Imagine seeing this in action. Imagine seeing this in action. It's it's genuinely sad that we only get to imagine what it looks like in there. It is honestly a miscarriage of justice that we can't see it. In my honest opinion. That's why I've, I'm rooting for Georgia. So thank you very much. Uh, we had some 
amazing things happen today. As you know, my son is graduated from high school, and it looks like the judge will not let me go to the graduation of my son, who's worked very, very hard. Uh, he's no, not Baron. Baron is a victim of this injustice, bro. It's funny to imagine a world where Trump would actually go and attend his son's high school graduation, but he does like Baron, I think, because he's tall. I'm proud of the fact that he did so well, and I was looking forward for years to have a graduation with his mother and father there, and it looks like the judges are going to allow me to escape this scam. It's a scam trial. If so thank you very much. Uh, we had Baron needs his son, dude. I mean, his son, his dad. That is, it's probably not quite the circus in there that it is out here. There's a certain amount of decorum that's required. Uh, there's a lot of people in that courtroom and a lot of static, I'm sure. But when the judge is on the bench and speaking, everyone needs to, you know, take notice and pay attention. Um, when the jurors walk in, they will show the appropriate respect for the courtroom. Everyone needs to do that. It's much like something that you would see on TV. Um, that's very, um, you know, a lot of people in the jury box, a lot of people in the courtroom and everyone in their position. Judge Do you think Baron is a Trump, uh, Baron is a Twitch account? Do you think he's watched your stream? I think Baron is a major Kai Sinat guy. He loves Andrew Tate. He loves Kai Sinat. Probably more of an Aiden Ross fan than anyone else, honestly. Um, and he probably is banned in here for calling me gay for painting my nails. Marshawn uh, is not a hothead. Um, the, today's jury selection, uh, today was jury selection and, um, they're looking for, uh, any kind of jury. I feel like he uses black Twitter thoughts. No, a juror laughed at him. Jurors react to seeing Donald Trump per pool. One woman in the second row from the back, right? Giggled and put her hand over her mouth, looking at the person seated next to her with raised eyebrows. That's the toughest battle that the jurors have is to act like they can be impartial in this case. I, I just, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard for the jurors to be like, yeah, I'm totally impartial uh, and I can judge this case adequately.